All right, we're nearly there. Part U, the last part of the introduction to cloud computing and data engineering. And there are only three real slides, so we're really right at the end. And uh, this is your fearless uh, instructor, Jeffrey Fox, uh, also drawing a deep breath of uh, happiness. Okay, we just discussed fault tolerance in this part. These, this is really other issues, it's not really the future. Um, Although fault tolerance, interest in fault tolerance is probably going to increase uh, because the large scale of exascale computers or hyperscale, cl hyperscale clouds um, stresses fault tolerance. And <clears throat> one of the key issues of saying cloud native is making your applications fault tolerant so you can exploit clouds which are designed to scale better rather than being fault tolerant. All right, so it's very easy to do fault tolerance. Um, actually, if you were doing it at UITS, you would do it by backing it up. Well, Amazon, et cetera, do it by backing up, but they back up five times. So a basic object gets stored six times, and or roughly six times, and you have this incredibly high um, Durability, uh, there's a difference between durability and availability. Obviously, uh, some of these rep replicas are not so easy to get to. And um, this is pretty, I mean, nothing is ever perfect, but this is pretty perfect. And you just replicate every bit of the storage. Now, there is amusing um, that they introduced uh, reduced redundancy storage, and it was in my notes. But if you actually go to the page, it's still there, but it's more expensive than, this, than the basic thing, because the basic thing has gone down, and they've lost interest in reduced redundancy storage. Maybe nobody was too complicated, and, the, and the, probably the price reduction just wasn't worth people worrying about it. So. Because this one has this slightly alarming number, the 0.01%. That's quite a lot. I mean, if you have um, 10,000 objects, that's one. So you're going to, too much loss. People don't really want that. And um, that's uh, used to be one third cheaper. I say it's now slightly more expensive on the same cost. And it was basically done uh, by storing it four times. And um, you would only want to do that because you're going to lose quite a lot if you can regenerate any lost data. But you also don't want the stress of regenerating it. So it's not so surprising maybe that that, that was just an idea that didn't work out. Although it could still come back in a different mode. But the trouble is I guess disks are so cheap that you can't make it dramatically uh, cheaper. Um, so let, let's sort of think a bit about fault tolerance. Um, namely, when you um, <coughs> have your program running, you need to sort of checkpoint your program. So when your computer crashes, you need to restart your, co your application. And it's slightly non-trivial to do that because when your program is, well, if your program is just one program and it stores results in a place you back up and it does it in a very clear fashion so that you can restart from that, those, that data, then it's clear how to do it. But in a real problem with um, parallelism, you have lots of jar, uh, processes, threads running, and then there are going to be messages running back and forth between them. And they really don't have a clear state. And so really that's why I, I, we emphasize in our work on distributed system, you need coordination points. Those are the points where state is defined. And you can launch off from those coordination points. Now having a coordination point introduces overhead. But you just don't do your coordination uh, that, that often. You just do it occasionally because when you, when pro, faults are not that common. So if a fault is once every week, and you back up once every 10 minutes, well, that's good. So you're going to be in great shape because you're going to most waste wait uh, 
a wait or 10 minutes, which is a negligible time compared to total running costs and things like that. Um, so, you one saves the state on disk typically, and uh, that's how MapReduce does it, because it, everything communicates via disk, and uh, the it uh, actually is a problem because disk is slow. But we counter that problem by only doing the backup at, uh, every so often, so that the time spent writing the disk is small compared to the time spent computing. Um, so parallel computing is particularly sensitive to fault tolerance because if one, the, you know, if you have a million processes running. Uh, then one that fails, then if you back up, then if that failure is not recoverable, um, the results of a million processes are thrown away. So that's pretty serious. Um, so that's why in the HPC case, where there's this tight synchronization and the programs really are so closely linked, you, you have to restart all of them. They make, they try very hard to make their systems totally, totally uh, fail safe. Um, so that points out that the style of computing affects things. If you're doing independent event processing, then this is not nearly as sensitive. So another important issue, I remember a talk by Eric Brewer, who was a pioneer in Inkme, which was one of the early search companies. He was telling us about a commercial search, and he pointed out you didn't actually have to get the right answer. And if you are going to put a whole bunch of recommendations of the results of the search, and you miss out 0.1% of the possible uh, things to look at, nobody will really notice. Um, so, th that is an important issue. Whereas, of course, if you're uh, recording bank transactions, and you lose 0.1% of all the bank transactions, that's a catastrophe. You will get slaughtered. So the application is, um, the fault tolerance needed is very application dependent. Um, and here, in the, this is this parallel computing argument. Namely, all right, so you're doing a weather simulation. You've chopped up the weather across the country. And you have one process just looking at Martinsville, one process looking at Bloomington. <coughs> And the Martinsville process breaks down. Well, what happens in Bloomington? Well, the Bloomington process will actually continue because the weather in Bloomington doesn't actually notice the weather in Martinsville for a bit. But eventually, the information from Martinsville will propagate due to the nature of differential equations. They propagate in time, and that will reach, or else the wind will blow. Who knows whether we think about it from a physics point of view or, or a Computing point of view. And then eventually, the fact that the Martinsville process is broken down means that the Bloomington process is dead. Can't do anything useful because it's waiting forever on the Martinsville process. So that's why classical HPC is more sensitive to faults. Information is spreading, and you cannot afford to ignore Martinsville uh, in the long run. All right, that's the end of the, this is the last slide in this, uh, this introduction. We should celebrate, have a, go and make a few Bitcoins to keep ourselves uh, busy and uh, make money or something. And uh, let's have fun. Thank you very much for enjoying Cloud Computing. Well, maybe if you didn't, but thanks a lot for looking at cloud, these slides on Cloud Computing. Uh, this is Jeffrey Fox signing off. Thank you.